chapter 9, verses 1 to 9. Saul's conversion. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath. He was eager to destroy the Lord's followers, so he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was nearing Damascus on this mission, a brilliant light from the heavens suddenly beamed down upon him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, sir? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men with Saul stood speechless with surprise for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. As Saul picked himself up off the ground, he found that he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and all that time he went without food and water. Uh, thank you, Jim, and thank you, Jerry, for the prayers and for the reading of God's word. As we come to hear God speak, let's pray together. Father, we ask now that you will take human voice and speak through it and take human hearts and make them receptive to your word, that we might be changed by you. Amen. <coughs> A man was clearing out his attic one afternoon, and he became very excited when he found an old oil lamp. Uh, he thought, I know what to do with an oil lamp. Everybody does it. He picked it up. And he began to rub it furiously, back and forth, back and forth. And all of a sudden, poof, there in front of him was a genie. The genie wasn't pleased. He was visibly angry. And he started shouting at the man, you selfish man, you interrupted my nap. You interrupted my thoughts. You interrupted my fantastic dream, the dream I was having. You've interrupted my whole life. There's no way I'm going to give you any wishes, you idiot. <laughs> and very quickly, the genie disappeared back into the lamp. And the man stood there staring at the lamp for what seemed like hours, but was just a few minutes. And then he said to himself, I must have rubbed him up the wrong way. <laughs> well, we're talking about interruptions. And interruptions happen frequently in life. Sometimes they can irritate us. <clears throat> the child pulling on our sleeve as we're trying to have a sensible conversation with a neighbor over the garden fence. They're trying to gain our attention, but we've got more important things to talk about. Or the work colleague interrupting an important video call because they need our assistance or advice. Well, then sometimes interruptions can surprise us. There we are busily going about our daily business when there's a knock on the door. So we stop what we're doing. We go to the door and somebody hands us a big bouquet of flowers. And we look at the card and it's a thank you from somebody that we've helped during the week. And we didn't even think anything of it. But sometimes <coughs> the interruptions come from an entirely different source. Sometimes they are divine interruptions. They come from God himself. And the Bible's full of such interruptions. There's Noah working away in the middle of nowhere, nowhere near the sea, no knowledge of the sea, had never seen it. Then all of a sudden God speaks, Noah, build a boat. And here's the specifications. And Noah did what he was asked to do. Moses tending sheep in the desert. And then he sees this sight of a bush, but the bush is surrounded by flames. But the bush itself isn't burning. 
and he kneels down in front of it and he hears God speak. I am who I am. Now, who's going to go for me? Who's going to set my people free from Egypt? And Moses responds. Elijah, feeling alone and afraid, he ran away to a mountain and he waited there for God to appear. And he expected God to appear in, in the thunder and in um, the earthquake and in the fire. But none of those things happened. And on the point of giving up, he heard a voice like the sound of thin silence. And God reminded him that he was not alone. And then into the New Testament, there are many times when Jesus interrupted people in their work with the words, leave what you're doing, leave your nets, leave your money collecting, leave your family and follow me. And our story this morning is a well-known one and is probably the classic story of a divine <coughs> interruption. The story of Saul and his conversion on the Damascus Road. And we know the story so well, don't we? But I think it's worth noting something as we start. We need to note that Saul believed he was doing the right thing. He believed he was acting for God. His life was devoted to the service of God. His desire was to do the will of God. He was a devout Jew. He was always trying to make sure that people were in line with what God's scriptures said. Tom Wright, <coughs> the former Bishop of Durham, says this of Saul. He was a highly intelligent, superbly educated, supremely biblically literate young man. He knew his scriptures. He knew his God. He thought he was serving him. And Saul believed that these followers of Jesus were getting in the way of God. They were getting in the way of what God wanted to do. And so he was going to round them up. He wanted to set out to Damascus to, co to collect them, to bring them back so that they could face trial. And he got all the necessary paperwork from the high priest and he set off. And we know what happened. Around noon, as the sun shone brightly, Damascus was in sight. A divine interruption took place that turned <coughs> his world upside down. You know, there must have been so much going on in Saul's mind as he made that journey. In verse 1, we're told that he was uttering threats with every breath against the followers of Jesus as he went to the high priest to get permission to arrest them. And I suspect that these threats were probably still festering in his mind as he made that long journey. But alongside that, I believe he couldn't erase from his mind images from something that happened perhaps a few days <coughs> or weeks previous, where he witnessed the death of a man called Stephen. Stephen was a follower of Jesus, a righteous man, a good man, and the way he died had an impact on Saul. Saul watched as the people stoned him. He was looking after their coats as they threw stones and killed Stephen. He witnessed Stephen praying to his newfound Lord. He saw Stephen's peace and confidence. He saw his glory and countenance, the glorious countenance of his face that shone with the radiance of Jesus himself. He heard his words, look, I see heaven open and I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then those words, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He also said, don't hold this against them, forgive them for what they're doing. There was something about Stephen that he couldn't quite grasp. He couldn't quite erase from his mind. And this obviously battled with the scriptures he knew so well. And he was probably as well trying to flick through the recesses of his mind to come up with passages that would justify the actions he was taking. And so it was about noon and he approached the city. Now noon is one of the designated times of prayer and meditation for devout Jews. And Saul, being such a godly man, would have taken this seriously, and he would have prayed, and he would have meditated. And it has been suggested by some commentators that one of the passages that Saul was concentrating on at this time 
was from Ezekiel chapter 1, in which the prophet had a vision of four-faced angels carrying what appeared to be a gleaming chariot with light, shining lights, flashing lights and wheels. And on the ground there, were, there was another wheel, and inside that wheel there were all kinds of different wheels. And all these wheels were going round and round. And there was a brightness about this vision. And the suggestion is that as he was meditating on this vision, that brightness became real. And then he heard a voice. And it was the voice of Jesus. Now that may be speculation. But what is clear is that he was met with a divine interruption. And in that moment, his thoughts, his mission, his very life began to change. And he was led into the city. And instead of rounding up the Christians and arresting them, he himself had been arrested. And for three days, blind and housebound, he had time to reflect and think through his experiences. <clears throat> now we might think, well, that was a long time ago. And that divine interruption, yes, it's there in the Bible, but what about today? Well, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the famous German theologian who was imprisoned during the war and then died shortly before the war ended. In his wonderful book, Life Together, writes these words. He says, we must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. God will be constantly crossing our paths and cancelling our plans by sending us people with claims and petitions. <coughs> we may pass them by preoccupied with our more important tasks. It is a strange fact that Christians and even ministers frequently consider their work so important and urgent that they will allow nothing to disturb them. They think they are doing God a service in this, but actually they are disdaining God's crooked yet straight path. And Bonhoeffer's point is quite simple. We as followers of Jesus should always Seek to listen to God in every moment and every situation. We should be open to him changing our thoughts and changing our plans. We should be open to him changing our direction. We should be open to him interrupting us. And divine interruptions do still happen today. <coughs> I can take you back to 1978. There I was working at uh, Safeway in Ellsford. I was cleaning silk screens. There I was, big screens in front of me, a water jet. I had my wellies on and my apron, and I was cleaning screens. I was thinking about football and music, and I was thinking what I was going to do that evening, where I was going to go for a drink and do what I was going to meet up with. And God interrupted me. And he interrupted me and he said, Train, <coughs> train for the ministry. I want you to be a minister. And it was as clear a voice as my voice is for you this morning. Totally unexpected. And it interrupted my thoughts and interrupted my life. I was preaching on one occasion in Stockport. And during my sermon, I challenged people about full-time work for God. And I said this, I said, <coughs> you may be the only person with the only skills that God can use in a particular situation. And after the service, a girl in her 20s came up to me and asked to speak to me. <coughs> and she told me that in that phrase, God spoke clearly to her about using her nursing skills overseas. And the following week, she contacted a missionary agency and was accepted for missionary work as a nurse. And that's a reminder that worship can sometimes be the unexpected place where God interrupts us. You know, I firmly believe that even now, <coughs> as I speak, God may well be preparing to interrupt people here. It may be an initial interruption. We've been coming to church for years We've heard so many sermons, yet we still haven't made a commitment to follow the Lord Jesus. 
And God may want to interrupt you this morning. He may, he may want to show you his reality. He may want to say to you, why, why don't you believe? Why are you dithering? Now is the time when you can make that decision to follow, follow, follow me. <coughs> we may be Christians. We may have responded to that invitation to allow Jesus into our lives. But somehow our lives have stalled. The initial joy and excitement has waned. And we now seem to be going through the motions. Yes, we come to church, but it really is hard to get up on a Sunday morning and go out the door. It really is hard to enter into the spirit of worship. And it may be that God wants to interrupt you, to fan back into flame the joy and love that you initially had for him, that you might be effective once more. It may be that you may be weighing up, to what, what, weighing up what you want to do with your life. Everything seems to be a bit stale. Work is a chore. Nothing excites you. <coughs> and it may be that Jesus wants to interrupt you with his design for your life. Maybe a new job. Maybe a task you haven't even considered. Maybe even missionary work or the ministry. But God may want to interrupt you this morning. And I would say to you, be ready to be interrupted. <coughs> Let me say three short things about divine interruptions. The first thing is this. Divine interruptions are a work of grace. Divine interruptions are a work of grace. There is no way that Saul was expecting to meet Jesus on that morning. And there was no way he deserved to meet Jesus on that morning. Everything he was doing was counter to what Jesus wanted. And yet Jesus interrupted his life. Saul didn't deserve to be given the opportunity to discover a new life and a new mission. But Jesus chose to interrupt his life and reveal himself to him. And isn't that the nature of grace? Because God's grace is a free gift, totally undeserved, totally unmerited. You know, in the kingdom of God, there's no exam that we have to pass to show that we're good enough to enter. There's no 50% pass mark so that we're in or we're out. So those of us who get 55%, we're in, but those who get 49%, you're out. It doesn't work like that. In the kingdom of God, we don't store up points like we do with nectar cards so that we can redeem them for anything in the heavenly superstore. It doesn't work like that. God doesn't count people's successes and failures, wealth or poverty, work or unemployment to determine who receives his love or his life. <coughs> Instead, he gives to whom he chooses. And he doesn't write people off. Instead, he looks at ways to reach people with the offer of his love. I remember Frank Cook, a great Baptist preacher from a few years ago, saying in an address when he was president of the Baptist Union, he said, I didn't find God. He turned over a stone and he found me. And that is true of each one of us here who knows Jesus as Lord and Saviour. We talk about finding Jesus, but we don't. He finds us. He, in his grace, reaches out to us. Those of us who know and serve Jesus are recipients of his grace. We didn't ask for it. We didn't deserve it. We could never earn it. But God showed it to us. And then all we needed to do was respond and receive it. And that means we cannot write anybody off from receiving God's grace. That son that you've been praying for, that daughter you've been praying for, that husband, that wife, that other member of your family, <coughs> those people you've been praying for for years that they might respond to the good news of Jesus. And yet they seem so resistant to any talk of Jesus when you're around them. 
They seem to be resistant to anything that happens. Keep on praying for them. Pray that God will interrupt them. Pray that God's grace may be at work. Pray that they will be discoverers of Jesus' love and grace for them. Those people who used to come to this church, who used to sit alongside you, who seem to be so on fire for Jesus, but now have nothing to do with the church for whatever reason, pray for them. Pray that they too will be interrupted by God, reminded of that faith they once had, reminded that they can't live without Jesus, that they might be reminded that they need to return to the flock. Those prodigals that need to rediscover the love of God the Father. And those people who we know whose lives seem so contrary to God's ways. <coughs> that neighbour who lives just along the road, who every time he opens the door, is, you know, he's shouting and swearing and, and you know, he's doing drugs and he's doing this you know, and he's drinking a lot. He's always coming home drunk. Yeah, his lifestyle is one that says, I have no time for religion. I have no time for anybody who goes to church. No, oh, pray for him. Pray for her. Pray that they may meet God. Because God doesn't write people off. He continually interrupts people and turns their lives upside down. And what's true of those initial <coughs> encounters of us coming to know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, that's true of all of our Christian life. He interrupts us all the time for different reasons and for different purposes that we might fall into line with him. Every divine interruption is a work of grace. But then divine interruptions are also an invitation. <coughs> because of his grace, God never forces us to do anything. He doesn't force us to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. He doesn't force us to become a, mis a minister or a missionary. He doesn't force us to become a church secretary or uh, a Sunday school teacher. He doesn't force us to come to church every week. He doesn't force us to do anything. He invites us. Saul could have decided to say to this Jesus who interrupted him, no, thank you. Thanks for meeting me on this road, but no, I've still got a mission to do. I'm still going to punish these people because they're not doing the things that I believe God wants them to do. Thanks for meeting me, but no thanks. We have to respond to the grace of God. <coughs> In the same way Jesus, when he interrupts our lives, says to us, I'd like you to join me. I'd like you to live by my design. I'd like you to do the things I want you to do, because I know those things are best for you. I want to bless you. I want to use you. What do you say about that? Are you prepared to join me? And he leaves it with us. When he interrupts us, God is inviting us to see life differently. To see him in all around us, in the lives of others, in our conversations, in our serving of those in needs. <coughs> God is inviting us to live by different standards in the world, to treat people differently, and to receive the benefits of his kingdom. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, Paul puts it this way. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. That's the invitation. To say goodbye to the old. Hello to the new. And be changed by him. And that leads me on to the third point, that divine interruptions always result in transformation. Saul met the risen Christ. He accepted the invitation and he couldn't remain the same. After this experience where he met Jesus, he changed. And the change was so, <coughs> easy, <coughs> so easy to see. Look at verse 19 of chapter 9. Afterwards, Saul ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus, Jesus in the synagogues, 
saying, he is indeed the son of God. <coughs> All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem? And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests? Saul's preaching became more and more powerful and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And this is the bit I love. This just shows what a sense of humour God has. After a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. <laughs> Here we have it. <coughs> Here we have it, the dramatic change, the persecutor becoming the proclaimer, the claims he denied being expounded with power, and the change is such that the people now plotted to kill him rather than him threatening to kill others. Transformation. This was all part of God's grace working within Saul. And the same grace is there to transform us. But be aware, such transformation isn't easy. It takes time and there will always be setbacks on the way. If any Christian tells you that being a Christian is easy, <coughs> I think I would suggest to you that they're not being entirely honest with you or entirely truthful. Or if they are being truthful, then they're living a funny kind of Christianity. Because it's hard being a Christian. It's hard resisting temptation. It's hard doing the things that God asks us to do. It's hard sharing our faith. Saul, so when he became Paul, said about his Christian life that the things he didn't want to do were the things he did. The things he wanted to do were the things he didn't do. He struggled. And so will we. But the more time we spend with Jesus, the more time we spend in prayer, in Bible study, <coughs> in living his life, the more we will change. You know, looking back over my life, I can honestly say that by the grace of God, I'm not the person I was when I first became a Christian. We are only talking earlier about, um, uh, I think it was Maggie who said that she'd heard some stories about me and I said, oh, what have you been hearing about? Oh, in Boys' Brigade. And I said, well, I was a model. I was a model um, lad in the Boys' Brigade. I, I sat there very quietly. I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, I think Rosemary disagreed with me. But, you know, when I think back what I was like back then and what I am now, I'm still the same cheeky person, but God has taken my life and he's transformed me. I look back with embarrassment sometimes to when I first became a minister and some of the first exploits into pastoral work and dealing with some of the situations I've had to deal with. You know, I'm, I know that I said some, some wrong things. I know that I gave some bad advice. And I know that I responded in the wrong ways to people. But then I developed. I became better at pastoral work. <coughs> I ended up being a chaplain where I had to listen to people ranting and raving and I treated them in a totally different way to the way I would have done way back then. God transforms us. And I always say that God owns, hones our strengths and compensates for our weaknesses. And I'm still being transformed. I'm still being changed now. <coughs> so there we have it. We have divine interruptions are a work of grace. Divine interruptions are an invitation. Divine interruptions are or always lead to transformation. But let me finish by saying this. Do not put a do not disturb sign over the door of your heart. Instead, be prepared to throw the door open so that God's divine interruptions <coughs> can come in and take hold of us. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that these words that have been spoken this morning may, may take <coughs> hold of our hearts and that we might be those who are prepared to be interrupted by you whenever you choose to interrupt us. And enable us to listen, enable us to respond. In Jesus' name, amen.